hello there. In the 1960s, as a part of Beeching's railway cuts, St Enoch railway station in the centre of Glasgow was closed. It was deemed surplus to requirements. And the 23,000 passengers who use the station every day now had to get their train at nearby Central Station. The station that lay for a, a few years um, and in 1977, after some protests, it was demolished. But it wasn't just the station, there was a huge red sandstone railway hotel attached to the, the station and I'm sure a lot of other smaller uh, structures um, sort of tagged on to it. The whole thing was knocked down. Which is rather sad because it, it sort of set off St Enoch Square. Um, I, I, I remember the whole as I say, it wasn't just the station, the whole complex. It was a rather attractive building. And as I say, it set off St Enoch Square. It, the square just doesn't look the same without it. The, the rubble from the demolition was dumped beneath my feet. Because this was once Queen's Dock. It was filled in in 1977 because it too had become surplus to requirements. In the 19th century, Glasgow continued to grow and expand, engulfing villages like Anderson, but not yet reaching York Hill and Partick in the west. The area bordered by Finison Street, the River Clyde and Kelvin Horse Street was largely unbuilt on. Close to Finison Street, there was a power loom factory, the Hyde Park Iron Foundry, and two big houses, Finison House and Stobcross House, the latter looking like a very early dwelling, possibly going way back to the 16th or 17th century. But, as ordnance survey maps show, the area was just a bit of land with nothing much on it. This land was acquired by the Clyde Navigation Trust, and in the 1870s work began to construct the new Queen's Dock.
course, it wasn't just Queen's Dock. Over a 30-year period, in the last quarter of the 19th century, other docks were built. Because Glasgow, it, the city's ability to import and export goods was limited by simply the, the, the lengths of the banks along the River Clyde. There's only so much space available there, and the only way you could increase that space was to build inland and create docks. Um, in 1867, Kingston Dock was built, which was on this side of the river, just on the other side of the Kingston Bridge, um, but where that bit of the quay collapsed not that long ago. Um, then you had Queen's Dock built in 1877, and Princess Dock, just here, which was originally called Cessnock Dock, was built in 1897, which is partially filled in, but thankfully a little bit of it still remains. And those docks, in addition to it, increased quayside facilities, um, like York Hill Quay, where you had the creation of the York Hill's East Basin and West Basin, which was essentially just a dock, um, and it too has been filled in. Uh, all this came together and was collectively known as Glasgow Harbour. I, I, I just, it provided a great increase in the city's ability to import and export goods. And at its height, this was one of the largest harbours in the world. The combination of Queen's Dock, Kingston Dock, Prince's Dock and Riverside Quays meant Glasgow Harbour now had almost 11 miles available for the accommodation of shipping. By the beginning of the 20th century, 10 million tonnes of cargo ranging from steam trains to coal and whisky was being handled by nearly 7 million tonnes of shipping, and Glasgow Harbour had become one of the world's major ports. The swing bridge that ran across the entrance to Queen's Dock, just to the right of the clock tower there, must have been very well built, because a railway line ran across it, and uh, those railway tracks would have to have been exactly lined up, or the train would have come off the rails. This was at one time York Hill Quay, just outside Queen's Dock, um, just on this end of Queen's Dock you had um, the Outer Basin, then the Swing Bridge, then you had the East Basin of York Hill Quay, York Hill Quay itself, and then its West Basin, which sort of looked like a dock, you know, it was quite, quite a kind of in, uh, inshoot, watery inshoot, if that's the, the term, and then it's been filled in, it was right beside and on this side of the Riverside Museum. All of these keys, whether they lined the docks or this one just lining the River Clyde, 
had warehouses along the, the edge. And these warehouses were used to store goods that were waiting to be exported on ships or goods that had been imported and they were just waiting to get loaded onto uh, horse-drawn vehicles and taken to their final destination. And all these warehouses had railway tracks leading to and from them. And it just, it, it, the rail, railway system allowed for an efficient movement of goods that had been imported and exported. And while mostly they've been either covered over or ripped up, occasionally you can just see a little bit of them. Right here, for example. The clock tower and adjacent building located beside what was once the entrance to Queen's Dock was not built just to tell the time. It actually housed a hydraulic pumping station which powered the swing bridge at the dock entrance and also cranes. But all good things must come to an end. There are many reasons why imports and exports declined on the River Clyde in the 20th century, why Glasgow Harbour closed, and why there are now essentially no more ships. And in many ways it is the river itself that is to blame. For the Clyde Navigation Trust, who were responsible for creating all these docks and generally maintaining the river, it was a constant battle to keep the Clyde deep enough to allow the movement of ships. Dredging was an ongoing process, and in the end the battle was lost. Ships in the second half of the 20th century were increasing in size. Huge container ships were appearing. Trade once carried out in the centre of Glasgow, in Glasgow Harbour, was being transferred downriver to Greenock and the Firth of Clyde. In June 1979, the very last ore carrier left Glasgow Harbour, and one by one all the warehouses and docks fell silent. Of course, I can't possibly end a video about Queen's Dock and Glasgow Harbour without at least mentioning the crane behind me. The finishing crane, built, I think it was in 1932, and a pretty big crane, able to lift up to about 175 tonnes. 
It was used to lift tanks and trains that had been built in Springburn onto ships bound for India and essentially places all around the world. And it remains today as one of very few reminders in this modern area of a time of great prosperity and industry when Glasgow was the second city of a once great British Empire. I'm Eddie Burns, I'll see you again.